Born on June 28, 1891, Carl Panzram was an American serial killer, arsonist, and all-around career criminal. Living on a desolate farm in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, both Carl's mother and father were emotionally unavailable from the beginning. Carl's father, John Panzram, had come to America in search of the American dream to find a fortune. Unfortunately, when he and his wife Matilda arrived, there was nothing for them but the dirt farm they found waiting for them. This left them with only broken dreams and memories of war from the old country. One year after Carl was born, an economic crisis hit. With this, the family would spend long, grueling hours working on the farm, each of the seven children starting at the age of two. Once Carl turned five, he was required by the state to attend school. Unfortunately, his parents would still force him to work his allotted time on the farm, leaving him sleep deprived. Ultimately, he would only be able to get around two to three hours of sleep a night. According to sources, Carl would be described as being in a zombie-like state in school. Along with this, he would witness his father turn to alcohol and violence, beating his family at the drop of a hat. After subjecting his family to these beatings for years, Carl's father would abandon the family. Three of the older sons would also leave. Carl was left with his mother as well as his three older siblings. Despite being only eight years old at this time, Carl was already running into trouble with the law. His first charge was being drunk and disorderly. At his young age, he was spiraling into alcoholism just like his father. Just one year later, Carl began to feel a pain in the back of his skull. Later, it would be found that this was an infection which was spreading throughout the bone. Once his mother took him to the doctor, she was told that this illness could potentially cause brain damage. However, Matilda had no money for treatment, and so she sprawled nine-year-old Carl out on the kitchen floor, took a knife, and attempted to perform her own surgery on his skull. Blood would pour out on the floor as she drove the blade deep into his bone. Not only did this further traumatize him, but it increased the pain he already had. Following this, he was rushed to the hospital to have a legitimate operation. It is theorized that whatever illness he had reached a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which controls sexual arousal and anger. This could explain his utterly heinous crimes later on. Either way, by this time, he already despised his mother and father, having fantasies of murdering them both. In the following years, Carl would be arrested several more times for being drunk and disorderly, as well as breaking into a neighbor's house. Around this time, Carl would realize that not everyone in the world was forced to endure abuse and hard labor. Some people were happy. It was this realization that turned his world upside down. In his mind, everyone else's life was fair, his was unfair. And therefore, to create balance, he must steal from others. It was at this point, he broke into another house, taking apples, cake, and a pistol. Deciding he'd had enough of his life on the farm, he ran away on a train with the goal of being a cowboy. However, he was swiftly caught and sent away by his mother to a reform school. Later in life, Carl would describe the school as teaching him about man's inhumanity to man. A building in the school was even nicknamed the paint shop. It was here that children were given severe beatings until they were black and blue. The staff would also use methods akin to torture in the same building. A towel soaked in salt water would first be placed on their backs. From here, they would be beaten with a leather strap. Once the strap had broken through the skin, the salt water would seep into their wounds, leaving the boys in immense pain. This method was often used as it left very little marks on the children. 
Unfortunately, Carl would become very familiar with his treatment, sometimes for something as simple as not correctly folding his napkin. In the same building, Carl, as well as the other boys, would be repeatedly raped by many staff workers. By the age of 12, Carl realized that this was nothing more than blatant abuse and hungered for some type of control. In his own words, if I couldn't injure those who injured me, then I would injure someone else. And with this, he began urinating and masturbating in the drinks and soups of the staff. Eventually, he was caught putting rat poison in one of the staff members' food. Shortly after this, he would burn the paint shop to the ground, committing his first arson. For this one, he would never be caught. In fact, he would be released a year later after the other boys taught him how to manipulate the staff members into thinking he had turned good. Not wanting to spend more time on the farm, Carl told his family that he was going to become a preacher. He would then find himself taking religious classes in the basement of a church. However, his antics would result in him getting into fights with the other boys. Whenever he walked into the room, the other boys would taunt him about his time spent in the reform school. Along with this, the pastor himself would begin beating Carl. Tired of this, he acquired a gun, stole a vest from his brother, and tucked the pistol inside. The next day, he would warn the pastor to leave him alone. Sometime after, the two fought, the pastor yanking him by his vest. This resulted in the gun falling to the ground. Before anyone realized what was going on, Carl grabbed the weapon, aimed it at the pastor's face, and pulled the trigger two or three times. Fortunately, the gun failed to go off, but the situation left the rest of the children in an uproar. Annoyed, Carl left the class and went home, believing that he was a hero. Oddly enough, he would face no real punishment for this attempted murder. Soon after this incident, at the age of 14, he would leave home, still wanting to become a cowboy. Having no money, he would beg for food, steal what he could to get by, and sleep in the empty boxcars of trains. One night, when his train stopped, Carl was feeling lonely. Wanting someone to talk to, he left his boxcar and made his way down the tracks. Soon, he would come across four homeless men and told them about the warm, hay-filled boxcar he was sleeping in. The homeless men who were out in the cold became interested and asked Carl to lead them to it, which he did. As soon as they were all in the boxcar and the train began to move, the four men would compliment him, telling him he was a nice boy and that they would make him rich. They just wanted a small favor. Carl soon realized the danger he was in. However, the cries, begs, and pleas he made meant nothing to the men. They gathered around him, knowing he couldn't escape. Being only 14, he didn't have the strength to fight off the fully grown men. It was here they would overpower him, remove his clothing, and repeatedly gang rape him throughout the night. Days later, Carl would find himself in a small town on the west coast. Here, Carl would stumble upon another group of men and beg them for a bite to eat. These men would allow Carl to join them, offering him beer and then whiskey. They would continue giving him alcohol until he was so drunk that he couldn't remember his own name. They too would gang rape him just like the men on the train. These two events would leave a blistering hatred to fester in his already troubled mind. A bloodlust grew within him and over the next few months, he would cause trouble wherever he went. That is, until he was sent to another reform school where he would be hawk-eyed by a one guard in particular. Carl, growing tired of this, grabbed a wooden board and hit the guard over the head with it, attempting to kill him. However, the guard did not die and Carl was beaten, locked up, and made to perform much harder labor than any of the other boys. Soon after this, 
Carl would befriend another boy named Jimmy Benson. Together, the two boys would concoct a scheme to escape the reform school. Jimmy would run off, and while the staff members were looking for him, Carl would leave the school unnoticed. The plan worked, and Carl headed to a water tower 40 miles away, reaching it three nights later. Not finding Jimmy, he slept on the ground and waited. Later on, he was awakened by the sound of rattling tin cans as well as the smell of food. As it turned out, it was a homeless man near the water tower. Carl gripped an iron bar which he had brought from the reform school, aiming to kill the man for his food, clothes, and pistol. However, the man heard Carl, grabbed the gun, and spun around. As it turned out, it was his friend Jimmy. And with that, the two celebrated, drinking alcohol and eating the food that Jimmy had stolen along the way. Over the next few months, the pair would rob churches and set fires to buildings. Along with this, they would bore holes in the bottom of boxcars filled with wheat and grain, letting it pour out onto the tracks as the train left. Eventually, they would reach North Dakota. By this time, they had $150 in cash, today's equivalents of around $5,000. Not only that, they had rings, watches, guns, and other goods they had stolen along their journey. It was here that the two would split ways. Jimmy would soon be arrested for robbery and be sentenced to 10 years in prison. On the other hand, Carl headed west. Around 1906, when he was 16, he would return to Montana. Having no money in the blistering cold of winter, he would then join the army, knowing they would be able to provide him with food and shelter. Unsurprisingly, his antics wouldn't stop here. Carl would refuse to do the work he was assigned and would be punished. Only a month after joining, he would be caught stealing valuables. For this, he would be sentenced to three years of military prison. Only a few months later, William Taft, the Secretary of War and future President of the United States, would sign off on his sentence. Prisoners in this military prison would be confined to windowless cells and be given food often covered in mold and bugs. Inmates who made escape attempts would be forced to wear a 50-pound iron ball around their ankle. At one point, Carl was forced to wear this iron ball around his ankle for a period of six months at all hours of the day. At the same time, he would be made to perform back-breaking labor. Even with this, his escape attempts continued. When these failed, he would set the prison shops on fire. Once again, he was never caught. In 1910, after 37 months in the prison, Carl would be released. A few months later, he would find himself on a train to Houston, Texas. However, the train wasn't able to enter the city. A massive fire had broken out, burning many buildings and houses. Carl would leave the train and walk through Houston, looking at all the chaos and dismay. The distraught families losing their homes and loved ones. Carl enjoyed all of it. Not only this, but those asking Carl for help would have their valuables stolen by him. Not much later, he traveled to Mexico, attempting to join their army but wasn't accepted. On his way back to the US, he would rob chicken coops and then set them on fire. If there were no chicken coops, he would burn down barns, sheds, and wooden fences. If there was no structure to burn, he would simply set fire to the grass on the prairie or anything else he could find. In addition, he would shoot his gun at the windows of houses as well as at live cows and horses. After this, he would befriend a Native American who was also a fellow criminal. Together, the two of them would attack a railroad worker in Texas. Both men would drag the unsuspecting worker into the bushes and rob him of $35. However, Carl would take it a step further and sexually assault the victim. With Carl being 6 feet tall and 190 pounds, there was little the worker could do to stop him. 
The Native American man refused to join in despite Carl encouraging him to. Just like his friendship with Jimmy, the two would part ways. Soon, Carl would find himself on another train with two homeless men. However, this time he and the two would be caught by one of the train workers. Carl, being good at manipulation, would convince this worker that both he and the homeless men were traveling to spread the word of God. In response to this, the worker would allow him to stay, offer the men food, and give Carl a watch. To repay the man for his kindness, Carl would rape and then beat him. He would then invite the other homeless men to join in, but they declined. After this, he would hold the two homeless men at gunpoint and force them to both rape the train worker. After the assault was over, Carl would throw all three men off the moving train. Over the next few months, his bloodlust and sexual urges would take over, taking the chance to sexually assault someone whenever he could. In his own words, whenever I met one that wasn't too rusty looking, I would make him raise his hands and drop his pants. I wasn't particular either, I rode them old and young, tall and short, black and white. It made no difference to me at all except that they were human beings. Eventually, he would find himself in Montana. Soon, he would be arrested for burglary and sent to the state prison. It was here that he would meet his old friend, Jimmy Benson. However, unlike his friend, Carl would not serve his full sentence and escape the prison eight months after arriving. A week later, he'd be arrested once again, being sent back to the same prison. In this particular prison, inmates were able to choose their cellmates and even get a new one by request at any time. Carl soon took advantage of this, stating, I used to want a new one pretty regular. According to him, sexually assaulting different inmates in his cell was all he did all day and even well into the night. He would do this like clockwork until he was released 23 months later. By 23 years old, he arrived in Oregon without a penny to his name. Doing what he did best, he'd break into a nearby home and steal valuables, which included a silver pocket watch. Later on, he would attempt to pawn this off of her cash. Unknown to Carl, the house he'd broken into belonged to C.R. Higgins, the president of the city bank. Carl was promptly arrested and given a plea deal. If he showed police where he stashed the other valuables, he'd essentially get only a slap on the wrist. Carl agreed to this and led them to a spot under the docks where he'd buried the items. Unfortunately, the police had no intention of following through on their deal. Carl was given seven years in prison. Before they transferred him, they would put him in the local jail. Angered about being lied to, Carl would break out of his cell, plug up the locks on the doors of the other inmates, and then destroy the jail in front of them. Still not satisfied, he would light the building on fire with the inmates still inside. Luckily, the fire was put out by police before it was able to spread. Following this, Carl was beaten and then eventually sent to the Oregon State Penitentiary. Methods of punishment inside this prison were torturous. It included fire hosing, straitjackets, solitary confinement inside coolers, as well as the infamous hummingbird. The hummingbird was a method of torture in which a chained prisoner would be placed in a tub of freezing water. From here, electricity would be circulated into their body. This method was so dangerous that it was required that a doctor be present just to make sure the prisoner was still alive after the torture. During Carl's stay in this prison, he and the warden, Harry Minto, grew to despise one another. Harry Minto's prison had previously been orderly, many inmates typically following directions out of fear and malnourishment. But now, Carl's antics had inspired them to begin causing trouble. During this time, Carl would continue his usual escape attempts, which always failed. However, he soon began helping other inmates escape, 
simply to piss off the warden. Other inmates would begin escaping on their own. One inmate, Otto Hooker, would follow Carl's instructions by getting a job on a farm. After this, he'd run off into the woods when he had the chance. Soon, Warden Minto would catch wind of this and personally search for Otto himself. Several hours later at midnight, the Warden would see the escaped inmate heading down a road. Armed with a shotgun, Minto aimed and pulled the trigger. He missed. Otto, armed with his own gun, fired back, shooting the Warden directly in the head. Warden Minto died instantly. Otto would soon be shot dead himself. Back in prison, Carl was amused by it all. This amusement would be short-lived as the Warden would be replaced by Minto's brother John. Despite him wanting vengeance for Harry's death, prisoners would continue raising hell. At one point, Carl would get all the prisoners drunk, encouraging them to fight the prison guards. While this was happening, he would again burn down the prison shops, causing $100,000 in damage. In today's rate, this would be approximately $1.5 million. Not too long after this, the state governor, James Withicombe, would visit the prison to investigate all the trouble. Once there, he would witness an inmate being hosed, a practice he had forbidden. Inmates would testify that the hosing practices left their sides black and blue. Following this, the new warden would resign in shame and Carl would be overjoyed knowing he indirectly ended two wardens. From this would come the third and final warden during Carl's stay, Warden Vinegar Cooper. Warden Vinegar Cooper would bring even more change to the prison. To everyone's surprise, it would be positive. No longer would inmates face pure brutality after causing trouble. The quality of food increased, more jobs were given out, and inmates were paid for working. This warden did not look down on the prisoners as a scum, rather people who needed guidance. As a result, violent incidences went down and even Carl himself was surprised by this, later stating, I had never seen anything like he was doing. There was no punishment of any kind except one, and that was to be locked away in a cell, given a bed to sleep on, three meals a day, plenty of books to read and exercise twice a day. Even more surprising, as a response to Carl's escape attempts, Warden Vinegar Cooper struck a deal with him. If Carl agreed to be back by supper time, the warden would allow him to leave the prison as he wished. Carl agreed, but had no intention of keeping his word. However, once outside, he no longer had a desire to flee and would return as agreed. For the first time in his life, he had developed respect for another human being and would behave himself. Soon after this, the warden would form a marching band allowing Carl to lead with a flag. Unfortunately, his strolls outside the prison would eventually get him into trouble. At a nearby hospital, Carl would take a nurse to a bar and got too drunk to remember to return at his agreed time. A week later, he would rob a house, steal a gun, and start a shootout with police in the middle of town. Later, he would admit that he would rather have died than face the warden knowing he broke their agreement. Unfortunately, this would be the last time Carl would ever show any type of remorse. Following his gun battle with police, his sentence would be doubled to 14 years. Displeased with this, he would disguise himself as a prison cook, break into the basement, and escape the building. The blistering hatred within Carl was still brewing, and soon after this, he would become one of America's most brutal serial killers. Despite having a $50 bounty on his head, luck would be on his side as in 1918, the United States would enter the First World War. The entire nation already preoccupied with battle, nobody noticed him even as he moved throughout the country. Eventually, he would take on the name John O'Leary until he would pick up a job at the Sinclair Oil Company. 
However, he would soon be let go for getting into fights. After this, he would light one of their oil rigs on fire. During the next few months, Cal would travel throughout the United States and Europe until he found himself in New Haven, Connecticut. It was here that he would seek revenge on the former president of the United States, William Taft. Carl would break into the former president's home stealing jewelry, liberty bonds, a pistol, and a watch presented to him by Congress. In all, he would steal approximately $40,000 worth of goods. Adjusted for inflation, this amounts to over $600,000. With the money he had stolen, he would buy a yacht, using it to hire sailors. However, once they were on board, he would offer them stolen alcohol until they had fallen unconscious. He would then rob and assault them. From here, Carl would put a bullet in their heads, tie a large rock to their bodies, and dump them overboard. Over the next three weeks, he would murder a total of ten men using this method. The disappearances of these men did not go unnoticed by the locals. With that, Carl would move on to another location, aiming to kill two more men. However, a storm would wreck his yacht, leaving him unable to do so. Without a boat, Carl would start work once again with a Sinclair oil company, where he would end up in Angola, Africa. During his stay there, he would purchase a 12-year-old girl for $8 from her parents. However, when he later discovered she wasn't a virgin, he took her back and demanded they return his money. In response to this, they would offer Carl the girl's eight-year-old sister. She would also be brought back by Carl after finding that she too was not a virgin. Following this, he essayed a young boy who worked as a waiter. The boy would then tell Carl's boss about the assault, resulting in Carl being fired again. Locals would also catch word of this and run him out of the village. Not learning his lesson, he would later grab a 12-year-old boy in a park outside the US consulate. Carl would then throw the boy down into a gravel pit and sexually assault him. Once he was done, he would shoot the boy in the head. In Carl's own words, His brains were coming out of his ears when I left him, and he will never be any deader. Carl would leave the corpse to bake in the ferocious heat of the sun. With the bloodlust within him reaching a boiling point, he would travel through Lobito Bay and rent a canoe. He and six African men would take this canoe into the waters to go hunting. Once they were in deep enough water, Carl would pull out his gun, quickly shooting them all in the back. A few would meet their deaths right there. Others, not so lucky to die quickly, slumped over, unaware of the horrors they were about to face. Carl would take each man one by one, and throw them overboard into the crocodile-infested waters. He would then watch, as the crocodile swarmed the six men and ripped them apart with their powerful jaws and razor-sharp teeth. Eventually, the bodies would be dragged below the surface, silencing their cries for help. Nothing would be left besides the blood and bits of flesh floating in the waters. Without batting an eye, Carl would make his way back to shore and hike approximately 300 miles to Belgian Congo before sneaking onto an American ship. Not long after this, in 1922, he would wind up in New York where he would continue his murderous habits. But before this, he would renew the license and bill of sale for his yacht, find a similar yacht, and then replace the name and number with his own. Carl would then travel down the coast and make a stop in Salem, Massachusetts. While traveling through the woods, he would spot a young boy and asked him if he would like to make 50 cents. The boy, named George Henry McMahon, would agree. Sometime afterward, Carl would take George to a pasture which resembled a swamp and essayed him multiple times. Following this, Carl would strangle the boy until he lost consciousness, took a blunt object, and beat the boy over the head with it many times. Blood and brain matter would be found splattered on the ground, all over the boy's body, as well as on some nearby rocks. George was then left for days in the summer heat, until he was found mangled and decomposed. During the autopsy, it would be found that pages from a magazine had been crammed down his throat. Later on, the body of George would be described as horribly maltreated. Along with this, his skull was found to be completely destroyed during the attack. 
Once word spread of this, schoolboys would arm themselves with shotguns, revolvers, and clubs to avenge their friend's death. Years later, Carl himself would state, I grabbed him by the arm and told him I was going to kill him. I stayed with the boy about three hours. During that time, I committed sodomy on the boy six times, and then I killed him by beating his brains out with a rock. I had stuffed down his throat several sheets of paper out of a magazine. I left him lying there with his brains coming out of his ears. Despite an angry mob of nearly 400 people searching for him, Carl would escape Salem and head back to New York. Here, he would commit a string of robberies before heading to Florida. Around this time, he was admitted to a hospital for an unknown reason, staying there for two months. Once he was discharged, he would steal two suitcases filled with cocaine, opium, and morphine, which he would then sell around Louisiana, Missouri, and New York. Once he had sold the remainder of the drugs, he would get a job as a night watchman at a mill. It was here he would meet a teenage boy named George who he would begin having relations with. In the next few months, Carl would find another boat similar to his original yacht, again swapping the numbers and name with his. Carl and George would repaint the yacht and attempt to sell it. However, a buyer would attempt to rob them while they were out on the water. Carl would shoot this man dead tie a hunk of lead around his body and throw him overboard. Ultimately, this would scare George who soon requested to go home. Surprisingly, Carl would allow this. George would go straight to the police, telling them of the relations the two had been having. Carl would soon be arrested and sent to jail. A lawyer by the name of Mr. Cashin would represent him in court under the agreement that Carl would give him the yacht if he won, which he did. However, once Mr. Cashin attempted to register the boat under his own name, the original owner showed up and took it. Before the lawyer could do anything about it, Carl would flee back to New Haven, Connecticut. Here, he would find a young boy, sexually assault, and then strangle him to death with a belt. After he was done, he would drag the body and leave it behind some bushes. This victim was never identified. Two more victims died on that day in New Haven. 45-year-old David Daly and William F. Berger, whose age is unknown. It is highly suspected that Carl Panzram killed both of these individuals. After this, Carl would travel to New York, obtaining a job on the U.S. grant which was headed for China. Unfortunately, he would be arrested for attempting to rob the New York Express office. For this, he would be sentenced to five years in prison. It would also be found that he still owed his 14 years in Oregon. Eventually, he would be sent to the Clinton Correctional Facility, located in the village of Danamora. Surrounded by mountains, there was little hope for escape. Not only this, but the conditions of the rat-infested prison were horrific. Even the military prison Carl had been to had indoor plumbing. This place did not. Inmates were locked in a dimly lit cell with barely enough room to stretch their legs. They were to remain silent at all times. If they were to address a guard, they were to do so approximately six feet away with their arms folded. Guards here ruled the grounds with an iron fist and inmates, especially new ones, lived in fear. Despite this, one of the first things Carl did was construct a time bomb, attempting to blow up one of the prison shops. Guards would find the bomb before it could be detonated. Luckily for Carl, two other inmates would be blamed for this and would be sent to isolation. Only a few days later, he would sneak behind a sleeping prison guard and hit him over the head with a 10-pound club. The guard would survive but would have motor control issues for the rest of his life. Then, six months after arriving, he would make his first escape attempt. At nightfall, he would use every ounce of strength he had to lift his cell door off its hinges. 
From here, he would retrieve a makeshift ladder he had constructed out of kitchen tools and twine. A few moments later, he would use it to scale up the prison wall. However, as he reached the top, the ladder would break. This resulted in him falling 30 feet straight onto concrete, breaking both his legs, ankles, rupturing a testicle, and fracturing his spine. Being the middle of the night, Carl would be left screaming in that spot for hours. Five days in the prison hospital, and he would be sent back to his cell with no treatment, not even a cast for his legs. Despite his broken bones, guards would still catch him attempting to sexually assault the other inmates. For the rest of his stay, he would be placed in isolation. It was within this dark cell that his mind would rot. The thoughts in his head would eventually match the darkness of the room. Carl began to formulate plans of mass murder. In one plan, he would place a bomb on train tracks, allowing it to explode as the train passed over it. In his own words, the explosion would set off and burst some large glass containers of formaldehyde and other gas and also set fire to a few hundred pounds of sulfur. The gas fumes thus generated and let loose in the closed tunnel would in a few minutes kill every living being on the whole train in the tunnel. In the second stage of his fantasy, he would gun down any survivors who tried to escape. In a separate plan, he would purchase pigs, starve them before feeding them a mixture of mash, flour, water and arsenic. Once the pigs died in agonizing death, he would hang them upside down, collecting the deadly foam dripping from their mouths. He would mix this foam with clay pots, filling them with more arsenic and putting them in the city's water supply. Another plan included stealing battleships and starting wars between England and the United States. After five years of madness, his time in Danamora was up. It was after this that he was to be transferred back to Oregon to serve his original 14-year sentence, but once again, luck was on his side. Due to lack of state funds, Oregon wasn't able to house him as a prisoner. And with that, he was free. Within the first few days of his release, he would commit one murder and approximately 11 robberies, ending up right back in prison in Washington, D.C. At this point in his life, Carl was 37 years old. Having been to prison and jail many times, he didn't expect anything to be different. To his surprise, it would be. In this prison, Carl would meet Henry Lesser, a 25-year-old prison guard. Henry took the job because he enjoyed the authority it came with, but having a strong sense of justice didn't abuse the role. Carl and Henry were polar opposites, Henry having a desire to always do the right thing, and Carl being a cold-blooded murderer with nothing but hatred in his eyes. Upon one of their first conversations, Carl would state to Henry, what I do is reform people. Weeks later, Henry would ask Carl to clarify this, to which he would respond that the only way to reform an individual was to kill them. For whatever reason, Henry would take an interest in Carl. Later on, Carl would be taken down to the prison basement. Here, the guards would handcuff him, tie a rope around the handcuffs, and hang him from a nine-foot pole. With his toes barely touching the ground, the joints in his body would stretch, causing him severe pain. The guards would leave him in this position for two nights until he confessed to murdering three boys. Henry would eventually hear about this torture. He would be horrified, both that it was happening and that there was nothing he could do to help. Once Carl was back in his cell, Henry would risk his job, sending a dollar bill to purchase something from the prison canteen. Carl was initially suspicious, but eventually thanked Henry and befriended him. Later on, Carl would state that Henry was the only person he ever fully trusted. Around this time, journalists would take an interest in Carl, wanting to know his life story. He would turn them down every time. However, Henry suggested that he write his own story, eventually smuggling him pencils and paper. It would take years for Carl to finish his autobiography. 
While he was writing this, he would be brought back to court for the murders he had committed in other states. For this, he was sentenced to 25 years in the Leavenworth Penitentiary located in Kansas. It was here he would be assigned laundry duty working under a man named Robert Warnke. Soon, the Great Depression hit the United States. Many inmates would turn to doing favors for disgraced bankers for extra cash since their jobs no longer paid enough. Carl began laundering extra handkerchiefs. Robert would find out about this, demoting him a grade. Being demoted a grade in this prison meant the loss of privileges. In Carl's case, he would be forbidden to use the commissary or receive mail. He was also sent to the hole, a dark cell where he was chained to the door and fed only bread and water. Upon being released from the hole, Carl requested that he be moved to the cement shed for work. The laundry room required too much standing, and due to his legs never healing properly, it was too hard on his body. This request was denied. Days passed with Carl appearing to be completely normal. However, on the inside, a storm of pure rage was brewing. On June 20th, 1929, this storm would come out. On this day, Carl went to the laundry room as normal, soon coming face to face with Robert. An argument between the two would soon ensue. This would escalate to Carl swinging a 10-pound bar across Robert's skull. Stunned, the foreman would fall to the ground. Carl would continue swinging the bar until Robert's cranium caved in. By this time, blood covered his face and clothes. Once Carl was done, Robert's body laid on the ground twitching. Carl then turned to the other men in the laundry room, aiming to kill them as well. However, Carl's limp slowed him down and the men were able to escape unharmed. Soon, the homicidal rage subsided and Carl made his way to a guard, informing him of what he had just done. For this murder, he was placed in the hole with another prisoner. On December 5th, 1929, he was convicted of first-degree murder. Even after this, he would continue to exchange letters with his friend Henry. Carl would look forward to his own execution. At one point, he actually became worried that it would be called off, attempting to take his own life by poisoning himself and slicing open his leg. However, the guards, finding him vomiting in the night, would take him to the prison hospital where his stomach was pumped. The Society for the Abolishment of Capital Punishment would even attempt to put a stop to his execution. Carl would send them a letter stating, I do not believe that being hanged until dead is a barbaric or inhumane punishment. I look forward that as a real pleasure and a big relief to me. The only thanks you or your kind will ever get from me for your efforts on my behalf is that I wish you all had one neck and that I had my hands on it. On September 5th, 1930, the day of his execution, the only regrets he expressed was not being able to read an article in a magazine that would be published the following month. After this, he would be led up to the prison gallows and asked if he had any last words. In response to this, Carl would say, Yes, hurry it up you hoosier bastard. I could hang a dozen men while you're fooling around. When the door below him dropped, Carl's body fell. Seconds later, the noose would snap his neck. At 6.18 AM on that day, he would be declared dead and so would end the tale of Carl Panzram. During his lifetime, he would admit to sexually assaulting over 1,000 people, killing 21, and being sent to over 100 jails. Thank you for watching my video, and a big, massive thanks to Disturbin for joining me. If you enjoy his videos, consider subscribing to my channel. Like him, I do dive deep into the gruesome details of the crimes. 
Also, if you are subscribed to me and haven't heard of him, definitely check his channel out. That's all I have for now. See you next time.